Since 2013, Diversified Rehabilitation Group has been a lifeline for first responders, veterans, and their families. Diversified offers personalized residential treatment for PTSD, post-traumatic stress injuries, anxiety, and depression. The Diversified team brings rich clinical expertise and has a strong understanding of first responders and veterans' unique culture, values, needs, and work settings. Diversified delivers tailored and immersive healing solutions for enduring mental health well-being. For more information, visit ptsdrecovery.ca. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Blue Lion, the podcast, a podcast created for and aimed at all members of law enforcement. I'm Brittany Schroeder, editor of Blue Line Magazine. Today, I'm joined by Chief Mental Health Officer Derek Shanko, who is a certified police chaplain who holds a master's in military psychology, Lucy Tremblay, who is a retired deputy chief of Via Rail Canada and retired senior officer of the Canadian Armed Forces, and Phil Lancaster, a retired police detective who has served on multiple police services. We're going to be looking at moral injury from the officer, leader, and clinician's perspectives. I'm really excited to be hearing from all of you today, and I think what we're going to be talking about is really important. So I want to say thank you all for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm going to jump right in, uh, and I want to start with you, Derek. Because moral injury is widely understudied, I just want to start with a quick definition of it. Generally, moral injury is a response to excessive moral pain resulting in emotional and psychological suffering. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yes, I, you're absolutely right. It really is. Uh, uh, but I would like to start with uh, one, one common dominator that there's no unified definition when it comes to moral injury. Uh, but uh, at large, moral injury, we refer to this as emotional, psychological, and spiritual distress individuals experience when their actions or the actions of others violate deeply held norms and beliefs uh, and expectations. So this can happen in various contexts, such as military combat, uh, healthcare setting, law enforcement, or even in everyday life. Moral injury can lead to have profound feelings of guilt, shame, anger, and existential distress. And it may require, in certain situations, a therapeutic intervention. Amazing. Thank you for, for expanding on that. I'm going to jump to Lucy now. Uh, you've spent almost 40 years in public service, and this includes time in the military and law enforcement, um, and even before that when you were in high school as a cadet. Um, you've held a variety of positions um, that go from, like I said, cadet up to leadership roles. And I would love to get your perspective on moral injury. Like, what did you feel as an officer and what did you see as a member of leadership? Thanks, Brittany, for your question. Um, you know, to, to me, just, um, you know, a few years ago, even not a few years, uh, I think morale injury was not, you know, in our dictionary as uh, police officers. But uh, one thing is for sure is officer safety has always been at the core of our business and a, a very high priority for police services and leadership. So, you know, we can't ignore today that, you know, the physical safety and the psychological safety go hand in hand and are critical to to an officer as you know a human being a a professional and must be on our mind as as leaders so now we're starting to be able to articulate a bit more morale injury what it is the outcomes the symptoms and um understand that this is uh, intimately linked to the overall wellness uh, of the officers, so um, this is um, you know so something that um, that I see today. So going back, uh, you know, much earlier in my career, when dealing with sources of stress in my environment, I remember discussing uh, certain you know morale, personal dilemmas I had uh, with peers, and sometimes from you know with supervisors as well, from time to time. And you know, back then, oftentimes we'd be you know, if we raise something that didn't seem right to us, we could be told, you know, this is not your business or um, it is what it is, or this is the military, not club mid. <laughs> so, you know, just deal with it. Um, so 
in the end, uh, sometimes we would end up laughing at a situation, but I was conscious that I had joined the military. I was a woman as well. And um, certain things that seemed wrong to us or, you know, maybe definitely wrong uh, were just normalized, you know, in our environment. So today uh, there's so much more awareness and education uh, and, and we can't ignore the importance of these little things taken separately and the outcome and the impact as a whole. Uh, it's part of our organizations, um, you know, and it's things that we struggle with. So as a leader in recent years, I became more aware for sure of the connections between all sources of stress from home as well and the workplace. And i am learned more to uh, see the human side of people around me and I can tell, I can see today that many chiefs and police leadership are more aware and caring um, as, you know, they see the trends, the more PTSI, the more suicides, and this is frightening for all of us in public safety. Of course, you really you, you hit the nail on the head there. It's, you know, it's concerning. Um, Phil, going over to you now, you know, as a police officer and detective, what do you think are some of the biggest causes of moral injury for members of law enforcement? And what impact does it have? Can you speak to any personal experiences? Yeah, I, I mean, I can speak to personal experiences. I think um, moral injury is um, attributed more to my perspective, what an officer has been involved in, like an officer related shooting um, or what they could have done to perhaps prevent a death. Um, so by way of example, um, throughout my career, I, I dealt with many deaths, mainly after the fact. But um, I also dealt with horrific injuries as a result of crimes or, or an incident that I'd attended. However, the one incident that, um, that did stick with me was um, a quite horrific motorcycle accident um, that I attended where a male had died, uh, actually died in front of me. Um, and I was just sitting there with him and watched him die. And his injuries at the time were, were really extreme. Uh, um, but as I sat and watched him take his, his last breath, which is the, the, you know, the agonal breathing, I always wondered if there was more that I could have done. And I think that sticks with officers. It's certainly stuck with me. Um, certainly to this day, you always question, is there, is there something that I could have done to save him, even though there wasn't? And I, in the back of my mind, I always knew that. But I was the first on the incident. It was a, a really horrific um, accident. And uh, the fact that the individual died in front of me was uh, was something that will always stick with me. So I think that side of, of moral injury, uh, you know, is prevalent across um, police and first responders. I think the other type, um, and um, Lucy touched on it, was um, moral injury as a result of leadership. Um, which can occur when, you know, working under ineffective leadership, especially uh, when there is a sense of betrayal or a breach of trust, uh, because as an officer, you do trust your supervisors. And if a supervisor's actions um, are not living up to the same values as as you, um, that has a has an impact. And I think it's becoming more and more evident um, than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I think these days, some of that could be attributed to uh, how policing has changed, uh, especially when it comes to social and mainstream media. You know, officers' actions, actions are always being um, scrutinised publicly, more so now. So they really rely and need the support of their supervisors. Uh, and when, it, when that is lacking, uh, they feel betrayal. Um, and let down, uh, rightly so, and they lose the trust in that leadership. Um, the result of this, and we're seeing it today, is actually the results that can be officer retention uh, and even recruitment. Um, there's uh, a crisis when it comes to re retaining officers and re recruit recruitment. We had the uh, defund police uh, movement just before and after COVID, which resulted in senior uh, police officers resigning, which is horrific. But you know, also when it when you look at recruitment and that strong sense of perhaps disappointment after joining the police service uh, and discovering that they don't feel actually valued or supported, I think that has an impact. So, um, you know, again, just speaking from my own experience throughout my career, you do naturally become slightly 
jaded and disillusioned throughout your career. Um, you get a sense sometimes of, um, you know, distrusting the motives of the organization for which you're a part of, um, not having faith and morality in the public, which is a big one, um, and more so now than ever before, I think. And, and then one of the main ones uh, um, was always the lack of faith. And I think any police officer you speak to um, will will say the same. The lack of faith in the justice system and anticipating the negative outcomes uh, when dealing with with criminals. Um, and I think um, a lot of police officers and senior officers will have a, a cynical view on that. So, again, just speaking from my experience, but that's how I interpret uh, moral injury. Thank you, Phil, for for giving us uh, your thoughts on it. You you touched on a lot there. And I want to drill down on this organizational aspect to it. Um, there has been some recent research done by graduate students at Athabasca University in Alberta, and they've shared that they've found moral injury may result when leadership fails to meet officers' needs, expectation, and values. I feel like this touches on what both of you have talked about already. But Lucy, I'll aim this first at you. You know, as someone who has been on both sides, you know, you've been an officer and you've been a deputy chief. Is there anything more that you think needs to be done from an organizational standpoint? And Phil, I'll ask you later as well, after after I've heard from Lucy first. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, having been part of it for so long, you know, military, police, culture are very similar. You know, their traditional environment and what people look for in their leadership is not necessarily the same as in other industries. And, and ultimately, uh, leadership is accountable for every aspect of, of what we do. So, um, you know, from budgets to policies and procedures, uh, professional standards. So is this officer going to retain his badge or lose it and, and have to change careers? Um, and no, uh, decision makers make decisions that are not, uh, you know, always popular, um, whether it's where we spend money, uh, uh, the leadership style as well. So, you know, what, what needs to be done from an organizational standpoint, uh, I, I think uh, better communications, you know, both ways and an and environment where, you know, communication is key. So, uh, at the right, you know, the right information at the right time uh, with the right messages um, and allowing officers, um, you know, people at all levels of the organization to question, you know, question policies, question decisions, uh, give them the opportunity to do uh, to do that. Uh, you know, the open door policy, you know, like not just say it, but actually, you know, uh, living it. So, and, and listening to what comes out um, of peer support groups as well. What do they talk about? What are the pain points or the frustration points? And, um, you know, listening, you know, is, is key. And maybe through that, we're able to perceive more, uh, you know, you know, get to the sources of moral injury among other frustrations in our, um, in our environment. And, and Phil, did you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think Lucy's uh, touched on um, some valuable points. I think, fortunately, we we are seeing a, a change, a shift, um, especially when it comes to leadership support. But I think, um, and I certainly don't want to get political, I think there needs to be more support from, um, you know, the, the, the government policies, things like this, because times have changed. Policing has changed and with it, with social media and cell phones and everything, certainly all this has been introduced um, following my career, is that the laws haven't kept up with that. And we see it all the time. And, and that is a, a greater sense of being let down by leadership and not just leadership within the organization, but leadership when I'm talking to politicians and, and, and changes in the law to support police officers in what they do daily. And it's a hard job. It's a very difficult job. And when you don't see that support, especially from a political level and the politicians supporting you, it, it impacts that moral in, injury. You feel let down. 
Definitely. Now, I'll ask this to both again, uh, Lucy and Phil. What do you see happening to the policing organization as a whole when many officers are suffering from moral injury? Uh, Lucy, do you want to start? Sure. Um, you know, I, I see a few things uh, happening. Uh, you know, I, overall organization and organizations and people, uh, I think, are becoming less resilient. And I, I think this is very sad to see that happening. Uh, people having really, you know, natural high, you know, being highly res resilient. Uh, and that starts to erode um, with you know, all, all the different things uh, happening, whether it's external pressures or internal to the organization, um, uh, the decline in morale unit, you know, unit morale, we, we call it in the military and even policing. Um, so it's, you know, it's up and down and it does depend a lot on the leadership and uh, whether, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the troops trust the leadership to do the right thing or add uh, act the right way and make the right uh, decisions and uh, now we see it as you know people leave the organization either sick uh, or taking early retirement so you know there's you know those the morale injury picture there's the daily trauma uh, and then you add up all the external um, you know stresses or pressures of uh, public expectation and and the trust in in what we do in uh in as first responders of course and phil what would you like to say um well again you know i mean there has to be changes from the top down and and at a political level as well and again i apologize i don't want to get too political on this um but i think it impacts moral injury across the across the board um, you know, officers are being scrutinized, as we know, not not years ago, like it was with me, where you, I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be accountability. There should be, by all means. Um, but that accountability is now you're being scrutinized not only by your peers, the leaders, your supervisors, but by the whole world when it's broadcast um, on social media and mainstream media. And it's and they're very selective on what they show. Um, but um, I think. One of the one of the main things is recruitment. When I when I joined the police, it was a career for 20, 30 years. And I'm sure it was the same with Lucy. Um, but now, because of the crisis, when it comes to recruitment and retention, people leaving early with stress, um, getting people to join um, the police service in the first place. It's not a 20, 30 year career anymore. It may be that officers are just staying in for two or three years. And when you train an officer up it's, it, and you, you invest that time into that police officer and then you lose them, you can't continue like that. You've got to be able to make it a career again and make it attractive and show them that they're being valued and supported. I agree. And I'll, I'll just throw this question out because I'd love to get both of your opinions. Do you think what's being done throughout let's say canada do you think we're moving in the right direction do you think leaders are you know making the right choices to to address moral injury and help their officers uh phil i'll actually ask you first yeah i think so i think there is a shift um you know we always spoke earlier and again i apologize i keep just referencing my my um experience no, in my okay. career, but it was always very much dealing with things was a stiff upper lip and and you know you move on to the next incident i think now we we we're, we're moving toward um actual support uh, understanding um uh, trying to mitigate stress um certainly the work that diversified is doing is is addressing um you know early stresses um so i think there is there is a shift there's a lot more that we can still do obviously but uh, i do see a, a change and lucy what do you think yeah, I see as we progress uh, to the future and, and keeping uh, our industry, you know, healthy is, um, you know, awareness and education, you know, it needs to start, uh, of course, at the recruit level, but leadership, um, you know, we need, um, you know, the authentic uh, and genuine leaders, we need, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the right level of awareness for 
you know, as you go through the organization, as you progress, you know, the 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 information, what you need to know on, on this important topic is one thing when you enter the organization and is one thing when your supervisor become a, um, a and go up uh, to the top of the organization. So you now the, the leadership aspect is, is very important. Um, and, and this is just one of those, you know, more topics that, um, you know, we need to uh, constantly educate, uh, research, what comes out of research. Uh, I think what I understand from the literature on, on this topic and, and listening to Derek is there's you know, not enough research as of yet. And even clinicians that specialize for, you know, uh, to, to take care of our first responders um, need to better educate themselves on the morale injury side of things because it's under the whole wellness uh, you know envelope but um one thing I, I think is very important uh that's going to help us in the future is diversity like a more diversified um, industry uh you know and i think in the end we're becoming much more humans first um than just what i knew from other traditional leader in the military in the you know 1980s or um in in policing uh it's changed tremendously and if we can um be able to recruit and retain you know the the right people uh and have diver the diversity that we need i think this is gonna help quite a bit in this area uh so that we can you know, not ignore what's in front of us and help producing those uh, really bad trends in, in police and first responder wellness. Awesome. I, I completely agree. And you mentioned clinicians there, and this is where I actually want to turn things back over to Derek. Um, question for you from the treatment perspective, what are you seeing that potentially police leadership or police employers are not seeing? Uh, I would like to just uh, summarize what uh, Lucy and, and Phil said. Uh, <laughs> awareness, being authentic leader, uh, and uh, paying the, uh, attention to those systematic factors that every organization operates on, like culture, or policies and procedures. As an authentic leader, uh, once, once you're aware, once you're familiar with the basic definition of what moral injury is, and how that impacts your organization, being that supportive person that nurtures uh, positive behavior of seeking help, uh, that uh, you are there for this individual who struggles with that moral injury by simply offering a kind word. Uh, I have tons of examples of people who come to our program who suffer from that moral injury component when they simply say, my leader wasn't there for me. Uh, my leader wasn't there for me. And they are not asking for a lot. They are asking for a kind word. Uh, one example that comes to mind that uh, there was a police officer that was investigated uh, uh, due to some uh, spousal dispute. Uh, the entire investigation process went, uh, uh, when the process was concluded, uh, he was clear from all, the, all those uh, things that were he was accused of, for of no one even come to him to say, you know what, sorry that you had to go through this, mm -hmm. just acknowledging and validating and being this for another human being. Uh, as simple as that, applying basic principles of empathy to the lens of your uh, organization, culture, to the lens of being there for another human being, being as an authentic leader, walking the talk is the key to, to, to make that happen for that individual. So that's what we are hearing from people who come to our program, say, and in my own clinical experience, when, when we hear statements from clients, from uh, patients who say, listen, no one was there for me. Or for those situations where they encounter, not necessarily from the leadership perspective, but from their own experiences, that was something against within the organization, against their values. So just having a conversation and validating that and showing some form of empathy will go way further than uh, the sticking uh, to those core uh, principle values not to talk about it, you know, which I think that must change. It you know, must change. 
having a conversation. I agree. I I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, Derek, what do you think treatment providers should be aware of when helping police officers address these moral injuries? So again, going to what Lucy and, and Phil say that, uh, well, the first they need to address that every police officer encounters more in injury on a daily basis, uh, if not daily, then weekly for sure. And uh, that this is uh, part of their job description. So uh, as a clinicians, they need to be aware of this. Instead, uh, going into that mode, oh my God, uh, what are we going to do with this client who is so morally injured? Recognizing that part that this is a part of that individual job, and then uh, turning their uh, selves as a clinicians to really understand what the culture of a specific organization is and the duties of of those uh, individuals who are working this, whether police officers or military personnel. And and then providing them with the appropriate coping skills and utilizing evidence based and holistic approach to when it comes to dealing with the moral injury, so encouraging this individual uh, to entertain exposure to the moral injury situations and conditions to prepare them how to recover from this more effectively. Because once once we make them aware well, as the clinicians instead. Um, being afraid of uh, diving into treating more injury, understanding the first responders, the military culture, what that really is and how to be there uh, for that individual who suffers from the more injury and walking uh, with them, providing them appropriate support, uh, having that conversation with them. That's what I think needs to happen. Frequently, what I'm seeing is that clinicians who do not have good understanding of military and the first responder culture, um, they are afraid of fully being that for an individual. Of course, they take into account the well-being of, of the individual, but understanding that this is their part of their daily life, then, uh, then the clinician should turn their efforts to empowering the individual how to cope with this. Definitely. Thank you so much for that, Derek. Um, I've I've learned a lot from our conversation so far. And one last question I want to give everyone is, you know, in your opinion, what can be done to move the needle on this issue? And Phil, I'm going to start with you. Um, I think it goes back to actually something that Lucy said, and um, we've we've discussed it internally um, is education, educating those um, about the challenges that are faced by first responders when it comes to moral injury. Amazing. And Lucy, would you add anything on top of that? Yes. Uh, again, uh, education, awareness, and the right messages for the right people at the right time. And, uh, um, you know, just oh, not just from my perspective, but looking at it from a high level is, you know, uh, more clinicians, you know, more services for uh, our first responders are military veterans and uh, more research in, in this area. But just speaking about it today, I think we'll just, uh, every time we, we, we speak of this topic, it helps elevate uh, the issues and uh, the, the consequences and try to turn things around for the better. Definitely. And Derek, what would you say? Agree with Lucy and Phil, awareness, education, and walking the talk. And, and remembering you know, one thing that a kind word from a leader to a member uh, is as powerful as the person going into therapy session. So that, that, uh, that's, this is the first step, uh, having that authentic leadership uh, and providing that basic support will get us way ahead of the game in order to cope with that moral injury aspects. Fantastic. I, I think that's a great way to to leave off today. Lucy, Phil, Derek, I just want to say thank you so much again for joining me on today's episode because you gave our audience and me a, a deeper look into moral injury and what really needs to be done from an organizational standpoint. And like Derek said, that first step, just having those conversations uh, from leadership. Uh, for all of our audience who tuned in, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Blue Line, the podcast. You can check us out on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also stay up to date on all of your Canadian policing news at blueline.ca. Thank you guys all once Thank again. You. Thank you. All Thank right. You. Until next time, stay safe and be well.